When did you know, Brian says, when did you know that you had really made it in the industry? Brian asks, when did I know I made it in the industry? Well, you know, there's a great uh, saying about that. Uh, there's three levels of, of success in any business. You know, it's when, and we'll use the film composing business. It's when you say, get me John Williams. Or, number two, get me someone who sounds like John Williams. <laughs> or three, get me a composer. <laughs> So depending on where you fall into that is the three levels of success. And I, so I think really when I knew I made it was when people would say, you know, called up and said, I want Mark Eichen. I want Mark Eichen to score this movie. There you go, you've made it to the, the top spot. Mark Harris asks, uh, when you're recording trumpet, uh, do you have a favorite microphone? Mark asks about uh, recording trumpet and my favorite microphone. Yeah, I've, I've got a, a couple. I'm using the Royer 122V. It's a brilliant uh, ribbon microphone with a tube. It sounds lovely, especially for the muted, Harman mute stuff. Uh, I've been using the M Audio Sputnik, which sounds great. Uh, yeah, I think it's it goes back and forth between those two. Right now. Uh, Matt Cruteau asks, uh, when you're working on an orchestral score, how much detail goes into the demos? Matt asks about demos for orchestral scores. Um, I'm very detail-oriented. Gotta be. It's, it's, it's expected now that you play them something and to the untrained ear it probably sounds like what it's going to be. You can't rely on uh, the comment, well, when it's real, you'll like it. That, that's something you don't dare do. You gotta, they got to love it in its demo form, and so whatever it takes to get that demo form to sound realistic and ultimately the word is convey the emotion that you're conveying. It's got to convey that emotion, and if you've got to work harder to get the demo to actually do it, you got to work harder to get the demo to actually do it. Anne uh, asks, copyist or software? Anne asks about copyists and software. Um, it, you know, it depends on the deadline. We do a lot of stuff in-house for smaller projects and, and use, you know, Finale, I think, is what we use. Um, obviously, for bigger projects, we need help. And then we go to outside copyists. And quite frankly, I'm sure, I don't think there's a copyist in the world that doesn't do it <laughs> digitally now. It's, it's a much different profession than it was 10 years ago. It, it's a computerized profession. Paul asks, what things should be avoided when mixing a score for cinema released films in regards to EQing, arranging, etc.? Paul asks about uh, the mixing process for, for films uh, released in the theater. Um, yeah, there is definitely a different point of view on mixing for film than it is for mixing for record. First of all, there's a technical difference. There's a Dolby curve involved theater speakers that you have to know about, you know, so you, whatever you're mixing, uh, whatever your room you're mixing in, you got to take that Dolby curve into uh, account. Uh, but there's also the phenomena that the lower you play a piece of music, especially in relationship to other sounds, the diff much different transparency of volume there is. In other words, what I'm saying is if you play a piece low, the lead instrument will start to sound much louder than it does if you play that piece, the entire piece, hotter. So let's say if you have a piece for trumpet and orchestra and you mix that trumpet to an orchestra to sound the way you would on a record. And then you play it behind dialogue, I guarantee you that trumpet's going to be too loud. So a really good film mixer knows that that solo instrument level has to change as you mix for film music. It has to be lower. You still need it to sound full, you still need it to be emotional on top of whatever the, the orchestral backdrop is, but it has to be lower. It has to sit in the mix in a different way or else it's, it's going to Im impact the way the film mix sounds. So a film music mixer is someone who really understands that phenomenon and really knows how to make that choice and that balance correctly. Uh, Tomas asks, which are your favorite Omnisphere pads re referring to Crash Flames? Uh, Tomas asks about uh, Omnisphere pads. 
I'm not going to remember the names. <laughs> in fact, I think Crash, it was pre-Omnisphere. I think in Crash, it was still Atmosphere. And it was so it was Atmosphere and Prophet 5. I remember I'm using the Prophet 5 plugin a lot. And I'm using Atmosphere, quite frankly, to sort of emulate that Oberheim feel, because to me, Crash was sort of a retro score from my, from my point of view. And everything I used was sort of... Uh, had a certain funkiness about it, sort of an old school retro feeling to it. So I was using the Prophet 5. Anything out of atmosphere that had that sort of 12 bit, get geeky for a minute here, 12 bit filter feel, like an Oberheim filter feel, was what I was after. Uh, the names I don't remember, but it was uh, very atmosphere driven. Our good friend Hugo is back and he says, uh, Who's your favorite composer and who's your favorite orchestrator? Uh, Hugo, my favorite composer. Well, you know, I go through cycles on this, but really in the last, well, quite a number of years now, John Adams is still my favorite. I, I've been gone back and listened to Naive and Sentimental Music again this last week, and that's, it's just a whole other league, you know, for my taste. So, so he's still number one in that regard. Uh, Orchestrator. Well, I've been working with Conrad Pope now for a number of years, and I think he's a genius. And fabulous. Uh, there's some other great ones here here in L.A. Uh, Mackenzie, uh, Brad Decker. There's, there's, there's some great orchestrators here. Susan would like to know what synths do you prefer working with? Susan, what uh, synths I, I use? Um, well, if you look at the back wall of my studio, I've got. Mobs and Arps and old Oberheims and uh, you know the great old stuff. So that's what my ear sort of is drawn to still. I, I'm using the plugins of all of those. Uh, what else have I been drawn to recently? I mean, Eric Persing to me is sort of the new genius of, of bringing that sensitivity and sensibility into the software world. There's something about his instruments that have the same musical sensibility that a Prophet 5 did the first moment I turned it on, or the old Oberheim did the first moment I turned those on. They felt like musical instruments to me. They didn't feel like science experiments that you had to sort of tweak forever to get anything meaningful out of. Uh, and Eric's, you know, instruments have that quality. So, uh, Omnisphere, uh, yeah, uh, Eric stuff, I just, uh, if I have to, to pick a single category, that's where I'd start. All right, so last one. Uh, on your live Houston Street band track, All I Want, or it's All I Need, actually, if you put All I Want. Uh, the intro sounds like a Fender Rhodes, but is there another synth playing along with it? Or is it a laptop playing some loops? Is it one guy or a duet? What instruments in the intro perform are performed on it, and what effects are being used? Who asked this? This is uh, uh, Harry Luke uh, Lycus. Harry, you ask about uh, all I need intro on the live uh, House and Street recordings. Um, that's Jeff Babco on the Fender Roads live. No overdubs, nothing. No pre-records, nothing. Just Jeff. A Fender Rhodes and a uh, Line 6. Line 6 with uh, the 16, I think the Electro Harmonic 16 second delay. So he's looping stuff live in real time, reversing it, making it play backwards in real time, and then playing against it. And the guy's a genius. I love it. I'm glad you like that intro because it's one of my favorite spots in the, in the whole House of experience. So thanks everybody for writing into the questions. Had a real good time answering it. And we'll be doing this every month, so see you soon.